Hi and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast focused on Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today for episode 98, we're going to explore this question of whether the Lightning Network can scale to a million channels. But first, let me introduce the sponsors of the podcast. Firstly, look into Kraken. They're a really impressive exchange. They have an incredible focus on security with Kraken Security Labs. They are consistently acting ethically in the space. They're one of the longest standing Bitcoin exchanges. They've got a high quality platform and they offer some of the best liquidity as well. And if you're trading, you need high volume and low fees, which is what Kraken offer. Kraken also offer 24 seven support. And on the institutional business solution side, they've got best in class accounting, reconciliation and reporting services for cryptocurrency hedge funds, asset managers and fund administrators. They offer the highest available API rate limits and there's a Kraken OTC desk. They offer five fiat currencies and also margin and futures trading. To learn more and sign up, go to the Kraken link in the show notes. Next, look into Unchained Capital. They're a Bitcoin financial services company and there's been a lot of chatter recently about multi-signature and Unchained Capital offer of two of three keys multi-signature vault product. It's really easy to set up. You can use Trezor or Ledger wallets. It helps protect you against that proverbial $5 wrench attack because you can keep your keys distributed, meaning you can't just spend only with the keys that you have on you right now. Customers who create that Unchained Vault also get three free months of access to Safety and Immerse's Bitcoin Standard Research Bulletin. Unchained also offer Bitcoin collateralized loans, so you can get USD without selling your Bitcoins, and that means you don't trigger a capital gains event. So you would pay interest, but this can be tax efficient for you, uh, meaning you can keep holding rather than selling. So while that loan's outstanding, it's stored under collaborative custody with Unchained. So if you want to learn more about that, go to the Unchained Capital link in the show notes. So today we're taking a slight break from the Hardware Wallet interview series to go back to Lightning. And so for episode 98, we've got Rusty Russell from Blockstream. He is a past guest of the show and also Joe Netty, who recently did an internship at Blockstream. So the Lightning Network exists today, but there are questions remaining on whether it can scale. What would it look like when it is larger? Well, that's what the Million Channel Project is trying to answer. So for example, will it still be accessible to people using lower powered devices such as mobile phones or Raspberry Pi computers that can be bought for say $40? We discussed some of those questions in this episode, as well as talking about routing and some of the recent changes and upcoming changes with Sea Lightning. On to the interview. Rusty and Joe, welcome to the show. Hi, how's it going? Hey, Stefan. Good to be back. Thanks for rejoining me, Rusty, and thanks for joining me, Joe. So uh, just a quick intro just for the listeners. Uh, Joe, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So um, got into Bitcoin in around 2013 and took me a while to kind of learn what it was about. And then I just kept diving deeper. Um, now I go to school at RIT in New York, uh, studying computer science. And this past spring, I did an internship at Blockstream, where I was with the Lightning team, with Rusty and with others, um, working on million channels projects and some plugins and Lightning. And that's where I am today, just interested in Lightning and Bitcoin and all that jazz. <laughs> Yeah, it must be uh, awesome to uh, be interning at Blockstream. And uh, Rusty, look, I think all my listeners know who you are, but maybe just take a minute just for the ones who, who don't know you, just take a minute and uh, tell us what you're working on these days and uh, what's your role. Yeah, so um, I guess mostly I'm known for um, my work on the Lightning implementation, uh, Sea Lightning and the spec efforts. So like obviously all the implementations we work together to try to create the specification, which really, I mean, I consider more important than the implementation, right? If code you can throw away, but you're stuck with whatever you agreed with to interoperate, right? So that's that's what I see as my main role is to kind of shepherd that that spec process and, and, and bring everyone together on that. Um, and that's obviously pretty exciting. Lots of lots of great stuff coming down the pipe uh, there. Um, and, you know, also I've got the team at, at, um, uh, at Blockstream, three of us now doing the Sea Lightning implementation. And a whole heap of other people, you know, it's an open source project. We get like a lot of cool uh, contributions, single drive buys and like, you know, uh, more significant contributions. In fact, the naming of the releases, which, which we've got a release coming out tomorrow. Well, I see one of them out tomorrow. So the release come out next week. The release gets named by whoever's done the most contributions in the last cycle, right? Who hasn't already named it. So, so yeah. Um, so it's always fun to see who's going to get to name the, the release. We have kind of these, we have a, we have a, a theme yeah. for our release names uh, that, uh, 
that's kind of an open secret among uh, <clears throat> among people who are who, who've named it already. So yeah, um, so yeah, my, my job's kind of shepherd those those two projects mainly, and, and just you know random things of Blockstream and and everything else. So there's, there's always a whole heap of stuff going on. Um, the first time, the first uh, intern I have had was Joe actually, um, which has set me up uh, I think really well. Like my expectations are now pretty high for what what interns should do, right? Um, because Joe did amazing work on uh, the Million Channels project, but um, he also, you know, in his in his copious spare time uh, that that left him somehow, he also did uh, a great GraphQL plugin stuff for us. That's it's really exciting. That there'll be obviously uh, that you'll be hearing more about um, in the future as well. I expect so. Yeah, um, I guess that's that's me and that's us and that's sure. that's how things are working. Great, yeah, that's awesome. So, look, at the topic, or our theme for today is the million you know, channel experiment. So, let's start with a little bit of what what spurred this experiment. Cool. So, this this the backstory sort of is um, you now we've seen this sort of explosive growth growth in the uh, uh, in the Lightning Network. It kind of went from from like you know a dozen nodes and in, in, in sort of 2018 when it sort of started on, on mainnet and it kind of kept growing and we'd seen some teething problems with you know scalability issues at a couple of points and you know there was always this idea of what we should do is we should simulate you know kind of like an end game like what, what would it look like in a million channels which is kind of a nominal you know it sounded like a big number at the time it's actually not such a big number now we're, we're you know i think we're we're around a 20th of that now so but at the time it was like wow when we're 100 times bigger what will things look like right um and so I had this idea, um, never had time to implement it, ended up putting out a blog post going, look, hey, it'd be really cool to do this million channels project where we simulate what the network might look like if we scaled it up and we had a million channels and however many nodes that is and everything else. And then we could basically simulate that and, and throw some existing software at it and watch it fall over and die. Um, and, you know, and, and obviously find out that, you know, that way, you know, what, what, what was gonna happen when we got that big, right? Um, because like a whole heap of implementations have been, yeah, there's been so much stuff to do, right? Uh, that optimizing uh, hasn't hasn't necessarily bubbled to the top, except as you know, as as you need to put out fires, right? So to try to get ahead of that, the idea of the Middle Channels project was to create this this kind of you know, real stress test, uh, this this genuine thing. Um, and then when when Joe um, came along as an intern, he he was really excited about it, and so he went right, and then he basically took that between his teeth and, and ran with it. Awesome. So, Joe, let's hear from you a little bit. What was your experience like with setting up and you know taking uh, taking part in this? And uh, as I understand, you took a snapshot of the current Lightning Network and used that to help inform this project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it's really cool. All right, so basically, uh, it started as a very open ended project. There was quite a lot we could have we could do. Um, we could like make a reg test network. We could uh, simulate it to as precise as we wanted to, and so it was very open ended. And I had to kind of define what I what I wanted to do. So uh, it took me kind of a while to dan dance around, kind of understand what the current properties of the Lightning Network of the snapshot Lightning Network was, and then kind of make an algorithm that would make a larger, also accurate Lightning Network. And should I go into the properties right now uh, about kind of what I what I learned about the snapshot and stuff? Yeah, sure. Let's do that. Do you want to maybe tell us, you know, what is uh, reg test mode as well? Sure. Yeah. So reg test is something that a lot of Bitcoin developers use to test their applications. Instead of using the main chain, they use this very lightweight local chain and tool called reg test mode in Bitcoin D, um, really Bitcoin core, and um, it allows you to make blocks with they basically have no difficulty so you could just mine blocks you can just make transactions and you can make a fake chain so that you can test your application and if since since the million channels project um made a large scale lightning network each each channel lightning network also has funding transactions and so we made a well, I made a reg test um replica of all of those funding transactions basically a, a a fake chain with you know blocks with all of these funding transactions that matched what the Lightning network was and that was that was pretty cool which was much cheaper than giving him a million dollars to do it on the real chain exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> 
So let's talk a little bit about the, the gossip uh, of uh, Lightning nodes. So how do Lightning nodes gossip to each other right now? So basically, you've got two parts of the Media Channels project we want to step back a bit. One is this, um, you obviously need a, a blockchain because what happens is, as a layer two thing, you kind of need a layer one. And when uh, a node says, hey, I've got this channel, you actually check on the blockchain that it actually exists. So you do kind of need the two parts. So you have this rig test fake blockchain, but you also have all these gossip messages. And the gossip messages are basically, hey, here's this new channel and I can prove it, right? I can prove that I own this channel. Um, and you know that basically tells you where in the Bitcoin blockchain to find the transaction that hasn't been spent yet. It is the right size. You go, yep, cool, I believe you. You too definitely have this channel, good. That's a channel announcement. There's a channel update, which is basically, hey, I decided I'm gonna charge this amount of fees and stuff like that. Um, and you have two of those. You have one for each direction because, you know, I, I control my half of the channel. You control your half. I'll go, oh, cool. I'm going to start charging these fees on stuff going through my half of the channel, my direction, right? Uh, and then you have node announcements. So nodes basically announce stuff like, hey, here's where you can reach me. Here's my IP address. Here's where you can access me on tour. Um, here's my favorite color. And here's like my alias. <laughs> um, we literally have these two fields in there, which people, people love, right? Um, they're completely... They're completely useless from one sense. They're um, they're completely vanity. Like you know, you can call your 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 node something, uh, and I can see it on explorers, and I can call my node exactly the same thing, and no one would be able to distinguish. Right? There's this public key that can distinguish them, but the node name anyone can make up. Right? So they're not secure. They're just for fun, but it proved to be like a really useful thing. But the node announcement really is for advertising where how you can connect to a node and stuff like that if you want to establish a direct channel. So you have all this gossip, right? So you, you basically have this, what did it turn out to be, Joe? It was like 70 megabytes or something of basically just this fire hose. Of, here's everything about the network at once. Yeah. 731, yeah, more right? More than 730, yeah. 730 yeah. megabytes. <laughs> 730, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's a chunk of data, right? And that is basically, think of like this new node going up, going, hi, I'm new on the network. It connects to one of these other nodes. He goes, right, here's the million channels that you don't know about. And just would throw like 730 megabytes at it. Of, of you know this entire description of the entire network, um, and so you can see the kind of things that we're dealing with when you're looking at wow okay that's 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 fun for an implementation to kind of handle that. Um, so so yeah that's the gossip right. So there's there's this pre canned gossip which is basically like here is the description as if you had connected to a new node and it was going to tell you everything about it. This is it and it's 731 megabytes right. It's 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 a chunk. Yeah, can I add to that? Yeah, sure, go for it. Yeah, yeah so um. Basically, you can kind of split the million channels into kind of three parts. You can have, see it as uh, taking a snapshot and making a larger simulated network. And then the second part is making the reg test data. And then the third part is making the gossip data. And uh, Rusty kind of just described the, the, the gossip part of that. Um, the, so that's literally channel announcements. Uh, channel update messages and node announcements. Yeah, so um, I know you're probably going to segue into this, but so then this, is, this is where Joe and I interface, right? So he produced this massive, here, here's 730 megabytes, Rusty, and I tried to feed it into Sea Lightning and watched it like slow to a crawl. I remember the first time Joe tried to feed it in, like he was, he was like, well, it's been running all night and it hasn't been <laughs> Oh man, that was horrible, yeah. So it really did. Yeah, yeah, like there were just some, some dumb stuff that we were just, you know, uh, we completely hadn't looked at. What do we do when there's a significant amount of data here? Um, so there was a whole heap of iterations of trying to get this all, you know, uh, manageable, right? Because um, on a scale of like over 20, sort of at the time, like almost 50 times what we were dealing with um, and a whole heap of stuff that, that dumb things we were doing um, <clears throat> that we had to go through and, and revise that. So for me, the exciting part was like basically taking this massive gossip output that he produced and trying to like cram it into one of my nodes um, right. and, and, and watch it, you know. Watch it fail in different ways. Yeah, it was crazy how many iterations there were with with like Rusty's optimizations. Like there was like a wave of optimizations and a second wave and third wave. It just kept coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was never it's never fast enough, right? <laughs> True. Yeah. And so in order to create that estimate as well, so as part of the reg test part of this uh ex experimental project, you had to create all the funding transactions, which is when somebody is starting and opening a lightning channel. So how did you, what was your process there around trying to simulate that? Yeah. So that, that wasn't, um, that bad. Basically I just grabbed a library that, uh, a Python library that, uh, 
allowed you to make scripts and and custom scripts and stuff. I just made a bunch of you know two to one multi sig transactions, which are the funny transactions, and then just basically made a bunch of um spent a bunch of coinbases to a bunch of funded funding transactions and that's it and that's and and that was it yeah so the hardest part i that wasn't that hard the harder part was um well, actually i will mention this uh the python library i was using was so slow with with signatures that and i didn't want to rewrite it in a different language after i already wrote it so i just ended up doing like this massive threading thing where like I well really paralyzed thing where I just made a bunch of signatures paralyzed because it was just so slow. So that was kind of funny, but yeah. <laughs> also, it was funny that you ran out of money, right? Oh um, my god, that was to actually dumb. create the yeah. Like, so it's a weird quirk in reg test mode. Who knew, right? So you know, like the Bitcoin halving, there's every like I think around two years is like a halving. Well, in reg test mode, since they want developers to be able to. Um, experiment with like what happens when there's a halving um they have halvings every like 250 blocks or so and that's like nothing i didn't want to have developers that are using million channels project to have to go in and recompile bitcoin core change parameter recompile bitcoin core so we had to actually scale down all the channel capacities so by like a factor of like i don't know like a thought like I don't know, like 10,000 or something, something like that. So they would actually, like, you know, I wouldn't run out of money. That, that was kind of dumb, but it's pretty cool. There are literally not enough reg test Bitcoins, yeah, because um, it halves too fast. And this is something we just didn't even realize playing around with it. We went, and Joe's like, I'm out of money. I'm like, how are you out of money? Right? <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. you know, uh, because cause you run out of block rewards too fast. So there were some quirks in there of like trying to simulate this 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 massive network. So it kind of ended up like this model train version where it's like scaled down. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it doesn't. The math doesn't matter, right? Like who cares, right? Uh, one Bitcoin or point one Bitcoin is all the same. But um, it was yeah, just just an added kind of hurdle in there uh, that that Joe discovered. And I kind of like that that model train example. That's basically what we're doing is is making a. Like kind of like a, a mini example of what Lightning Network could be. Yeah, and as part of that, then you've got this power law distribution, uh, which you use to model that out as well in terms of how many nodes there are, how many channels those nodes have, and what is the capacity of those channels. Can you comment a little on that? Yeah, definitely. So uh, there is about four properties of the Lightning Network that I thought would last in the future. And that's kind of the that's kind of what we're doing. We're trying to predict what Lightning Network is going to be, take away the properties that are 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 kind of fundamental to how this network will work. And one of them um, is that there's a power law distribution, and a power law is basically like you can imagine like a hockey stick. Um, there's a power law distribution of the number of channels across nodes. So what I mean by that is around 20% of the nodes will have one channel only. Around 10% might have two channels. Around maybe 5% will have three channels and so on. And it gets less and less and less um, in, in a power law distribution. And you could search that up. And um, that, that's kind of cool. It shows that there might be, there might be long-term hubs where there's a, lo there's a small amount of nodes that have like a lot of channels, like maybe... It could be like a thousand channels, maybe, and then most nodes only have one to five. And so I try to get that into, I try to get that that property into the simulation. And and on top of that, there's there's a second property. Yeah, we're certainly, to be fair, yeah. we're we're seeing that today, right? So we have you know we have a certain number of whales, we have a whole heap of minnows, we have like a whole heap of range in between. But you know, right? Um, that that is definitely the way the network. And and this is a lot of things, right? So so Joe kind of. You know, describes the power law. It describes a lot of natural networks that occur. You end up with a certain number of huge things and a small number of large things, and then like you know, a whole heap of minnows. And and that's definitely what we see today. And I think you know, Joe latched onto that as like, okay, that's pretty well established. That's going to continue. Right. Exactly. And 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 not only with with ch number of channels, it it's also true with the amount of Bitcoin that is held by each node. Um, there's some there's some small amount of nodes that have just a ton of Bitcoin 
in their channels and then there's some some nodes that have a very small amount of bitcoin in their channels and it follows the same distribution which is also the second property that's modeled in in this in this new network right you've got your bit refills and your ln bigs of the world LN and, bigs. and you've got <laughs> yeah yep. yeah <laughs> I'm also interested to talk a little bit about routing. Now, Rusty, I've seen some, you had a few blog posts talking about this. And I think back in the earlier days, you had, you were talking about how you, you had this approach of Bellman, Ford, Gibson. Maybe we'll just start with a, a few basic points around routing. What are some of the things that we should think about there? And what were some of the decisions made around, you know, what algorithm to use? Cool. So, yeah, um, well, first, first, so so when we talk about routing, uh, in the for privacy reasons, the the sender decides where the route is, right? So we kind of look through and go, okay, um, uh, you decide how to get the, the payment to the recipient. Um, it's also because you're paying fees at each point, right? So you have to kind of know what fees you're going to have to pay, so you have to kind of preload that into your payment. Um, but also, uh, each each layer basically unwraps it, and then oh, okay, so that's where it's going next. So so the the the, the hops on the path can only see where it just came from, and where this was to send it to. Um, so that provides uh, anonymity for the, you know, uh, for the sender, um, and it re- provides obfuscation for the receiver, right? Um, so the receiver doesn't know where the sender came from. The sender obviously knows where the receiver is because it's sending them. Um, but uh, in order to make that work really well, you kind of have to have a fixed size thing that's going through. Obviously, if you, you, you decrypted it, took the head off, and like sent the rest of it along, it would get smaller, the message would get smaller as you went, um, so you did it naively. Uh, and you'd kind of be able to look at the size and go, well, I reckon, I'm, like, I reckon the next hop is the last one, right? Which would obviously leak too much information. So you have to pick a number. How, how, how big is this? You're going you're gonna to pad it as you go through, um, but all of them need to be the same size, so that's a good number. Uh, and we chose 20. We chose, well, if we, we've got like, it costs us this much for each hop, we multiply it out, we want to be able to fit it in one TCP packet, 1300 bytes okay but let's go for 20. Um, and even in, interestingly even in the million channels project this was not an issue right so even with a million channels it, you know you didn't need to use 20 hops i don't think joe did we actually measure the worst case width from like the, the furthest two points yeah i don't think we did but i i highly doubt it actually reached yeah 20. yeah we might have been able to find some perverse thing that maybe maybe got close but uh but generally no you didn't need anything like this and so that shows that that you know we that, that 20 was like way more than we probably needed um, interestingly that we just merged uh in the spec change a variable onion so we've actually bumped that number up rather than each one being fixed we now kind of go for a variable size chunk that you take um so you still got the same total but actually you can squeeze things a little bit more and you could probably get to 24. the reason to do that was actually the reverse that we wanted to cram more in information in for some hops uh, but as a side effect we can actually probably get out to maybe 28 i think is is kind of the new reasonable but we don't need it right um even even for the 10 million channels project i think we're still going to be good for for 20 hops so that's why we have that kind of limit there yeah the part of the reason why i think we're also good is just uh, if we ha- if this power law thing continues then there's going to be kind of these hubs kind of Ch- basically uh, some nodes will have a lot of channels and that'll help you know n- help us not reach this 20 whatever limit Right. And so we've got this idea then that more hops can theoretically give you more privacy, but that's kind of additional packing of fake layers to, as you mentioned, the padding. Uh, and then if it's less hops, then theoretically it's cheaper, right? Because you're going less hops in the route. And Rusty, can you also chat about how I think in the earlier days, there was that concept of potentially having negative cost uh, for rebalancing and then that being removed from the spec? Yeah, so it didn't make it into the spec 1.1. There was originally this idea of, hey, you could offer people money to use your routes, right? So because um, and Andreas Antonopoulos had this really good uh, analogy of like a channel, like a like a PVC pipe with peanuts in it, right? And all the peanuts start down my end, and I send peanuts across to your end, right? Um, and this is, I, I like this because it's, it, it just shows that whole channel balance problem, right? I mean, you know, if you don't have any peanuts in the pipe, you can't send any more to me. So you do want to kind of keep these channels balanced. Um, and there was this idea that, well, what I could do is I could provide negative fees, which is basically paying other people to balance the channel for me. And I, okay, well, you, if you use this channel, uh, I will actually pay you to send some money through because I want you to balance. Um, and Christian Decker points out that 
that doesn't actually make sense because you could do that yourself by routing around in a circle um, and go, oh, well, I can push out through that node and around through that node and back to that node, and then I can push payments around uh, to rebalance my own channels. And if it's expensive for me to do that, um, so, so if that, that actually starts making sense, you go, well, then other people will start routing through that way anyway. So it turns out there isn't actually a huge demand for, for providing this kind of liquidity because you can do it yourself. Um, so uh, the other thing is that ideally, you know, you don't, you don't kind of need negative, you just need to be cheaper than everyone else. Now at the moment, we're, we're seeing like ridiculously cheap fees for routing on the light network. It's probably not sustainable. I expect long-term they will go up. Just simply, you know, you can't charge like a millionth plus like one Satoshi uh, for, for a payment at one millionth is just not enough to kind of keep the lights on. Uh, so I expect those numbers to kind of creep up. You know, people want to they want reliable nodes. They want them to be on all the time. They want them to have high availability, lots of capacity that that number is going to have to increase. And once that has increased, then you don't need to go negative. You just go, well, I'm just going to go really cheap and people will start, you know, funding through this. Um, so, uh, but also from a technical perspective, it turns out a number of, of algorithms break down if you have negative fees, right? Um, yeah, yeah. You end up, your algorithms really want to start routing, use your 20 hops to go around in a circle as many times as you can to go through that like negative fee one to collect as much money as you can. You end up with these really weird situations where the ideal is, is, is strange. So, so negative fee is actually just from a computer science point of view becomes difficult. Um, so, so we kind of, that, that didn't make it into the spec, there wasn't enough conviction that it, it needed to go in and I doubt at this stage it's going to. Um, of course, you know, you could always implement negative fees on top. Like I promise that if you try to use it. So, so what happens is when you actually send a payment, you say, here's the fee I'm prepared to pay. Uh, now, normally that would match what they advertise, right? They'd be like, well, yeah, I said you had to pay, you know, 0.1% plus 10 Satoshis. And that's what you've done. Um, if you don't know, they can choose to accept it anyway. Uh, they go, oh, well, you're, you're overpaying me on fees, but that's cool. I'm happy with that. Or you're paying less. So you could have some external thing where you, someone advertises, hey, you know, they tweet out, hey, if you route through here, I will accept negative fees. I will actually pay you to do this. Um, and if that becomes popular, then we put it, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll make it a mainstream thing. Like we'll put it in the gospel algorithm and make it all work. But uh, we haven't seen a huge demand for that at the moment. Great. Uh, Joe, did you want to comment a little bit around the differences that you see between the Bellman Ford Gibson versus the Dijkstra algorithm? Mm, I don't have too much to add to that. Okay, sure. Uh, Rusty, did you want to comment a little on that as well? Yeah. Okay. So, so we went for this, this, this superb, uh, elegant, uh, you know, uh, uh, algorithm that basically will give you the best, uh, the cheapest route for every possible distance. So, because you've got this, this hard limit, like, you know, it doesn't matter how cheap a route is, it takes you 21 hops to get there. And as I said, normally we don't hit that, but it's quite possible that somebody could deliberately force you into that by creating this long chain of, of nodes that just designed to mess with your implementation that, that makes uh, that long, lo they create like a long line of channels that goes like just this whole loop that's like 20 long, that, that's free, right? Your, you know, the computer science, like your, uh, your dumb routing algorithm is just going to fall down that hole all the time. And they're going to keep trying to like route through that. And they go, oh, but wait, oh, it's the cheapest, but it's not, it's not, I can't use it because it's now, it's 21 hops, right? So you do have to be robust against that kind of adversarial behavior, even though it like, quote, never happens. Um, so, Bellman Ford Gibson is incredibly, uh, you know, elegant and, and will, will give you the best answer for every possible distance, right? Like for zero to 20, it'll say, here's, you know, it's not possible to get there in less than five hops and here's, and you look at them, you go, cool. So you do it in seven hops and that's cheapest because it goes this path. Great. I gives the answer all at once, but it's, it's relatively slow. Um, and on the media channels project, it really started to, to bite us. We sort of went, actually that's, that's starting to hurt. Um, you know, so. Okay, so we have to do something less than perfect. And you have a lot of wiggle room here because basically fees are so, so low that, you know, you don't actually need the cheapest path, right? You need something, you know, something competitive. But if you're paying an extra like 10, 10 milli Satoshis, nobody cares. They really don't care, right? Um, you know, to remember, like if, if Bitcoin hits a million dollars, then one Satoshi is one cent. So at that point, when Bitcoin is like totally mooned um, and... A Satoshi's worth a cent. A milli Satoshi is still like a fraction of a cent, right? Nobody cares, right? So, so you can you can you can do a whole heap of approximations. And there's this great algorithm called Dijkstra, which is really fast, uh, but doesn't handle like it falls off a cliff if you have more than you know if you have some kind of length limit. So, what you do is you run that, and most of the time, you know, 
there's no adversarial network, nobody's doing any crazy stuff, and you've got your answer, right? Uh, but then if it doesn't work, you still have to fall back on something that can handle the hard cases. Um, and that basically uh, cut through a lot of the stuff that we were doing and meant that you know, we had a much faster you know, competitive uh, routing algorithm. So, you know, and there's more room to, to go there, right? That's just completely generic. Most of the time you're asking the same question, which is how do I get from my node somewhere else, right? You're asking the same question over and over again. Um, so you can cache a whole heap of stuff. We could, we could get smarter. Um, there's already been some talk of you know how do how do we handle you know um, a really massive kind of um, uh, uh, massive rates of queries, right? So I, I did a, a measurement recently on the current one um, on my Raspberry Pi. I takes on average if I pick two random nodes and say how do I route between them to get an answer back it takes an average of like 300 milliseconds. Um, and that's on my little Raspberry Pi. It's like this tiny little Pi 2B like computer. Uh, this previous generation of Raspberry Pi. So I run that just so that I can do these kind of tests, right? Now, a third of a second is not fast, but it's not slow either, right? That's acceptable on your mobile phone, right? So you're on your cell phone, you hit route. It takes a third of a second to figure it out. Um, okay, that's that's okay. But you know, we can definitely get more aggressive, and we can do even more stuff on top of that. And as we talk of, you know. Um, what do we do? Because what happens if that first route fails? You have to find another one, okay, that goes around that bit. Um, and yeah, so so this, you know, hey, we could we could do a whole episode on the fun of routing algorithms, but um, but basically, yeah, uh, th this was one of the great outcomes of this project. So yeah, this really is going to be a problem here. Um, we really can do better. Um, and there was no immediate incentive to do it today, but I kind of you know Joe threw the stuff at me, and I'm like, oh, we gotta you know we gotta get better than this, right? We can't take ten seconds to route through this thing. We've got to we've got to cut that well sub second. So um, so the numbers are in the blog post, and, and yeah, Dijkstra was a was a big improvement. Although we have to kind of have to have this fallback approach to handle hard cases. Right, and as I understand, with the routing algorithm using Dijkstra, is that something at a specification level, or is that more of a C lightning level? Yeah, more at the C lightning level. You can, I mean, yeah, you, you pick how you know, you've got the graph, you've got like the map. Uh, you figure out how to get there, right? Um, and that, that's that, that's it, it, it's kind of it's more freeing in a way. I don't have to ask anyone else. I can just go and go. Okay, let's let's try this and and, and do stuff. Um, but yeah, some of that that knowledge, of course, is shared between all the teams, though. Um, so even that implementation detail stuff, we do talk all the time about. You know, hey, how are you guys solving this? How are you doing this one? So um, so there's a lot of informal communication, but it doesn't have to be in at the spec level. <laughs> A quick word for a sponsor, check out the Breeze app. It's a lightning application that I've found really interesting in the way it's set up. So when you download this application, Breeze automatically opens a channel your way. So you've already got 1 million sats of incoming liquidity. Just note, I recently interviewed Roy Scheinfeld, the CEO and co-founder on episode 94. So just note, it's a seedless onboarding. It's running Neutrino. It's using submarine swaps for on-chain transactions, and you can share a link to pay your friends in seconds. They've got an Apple version and an Android version as well. Go to breeze.technology to get it. Now, back to the interview. Let's talk a little bit then. So you mentioned there around the Raspi, you know, and trying to make it work for the Raspi versus, you know, routing from a desktop level PC. How do you kind of think about that? Is it going to be... You know, most you think most users are going to be out on a mobile, and they're going to have to route from a mobile, or is it more like that mobile is connected back to their, say, their desktop PC, and so therefore they can kind of let the desktop PC do the heavy lifting? Uh, I think it's clear that like we're headed, we're an all mobile world now, right? Uh, so you, you really do have to fit into that form factor, and you know, um, but also the, we have a user who was complaining about performance issues, um, and I was like, "What's your platform?" I was like, "Well, I've got this little Raspberry Pi, and I've got this external hard drive I'm plugged in." And I'm thinking, "Wow, that is like, it's not even an SSD. Like, it's spinning rust. It is, uh, and the Raspberry Pi has this really crappy USB port, at least of the, 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 of the three they do. So, um, yeah, it's like, wow. Okay, so that's that's about as slow as you can get. So I went out and got one and I installed C Lightning on it because. You know, if we've got users who are running this, I want to make sure that it's it's usable, right? So um, you can actually look it up on Explorers. <laughs> Rustberry Pi is the my little Raspberry Pi here. Uh, it has one channel open at the moment, um, and uh, so so this this was exactly what uh, what was kind of the point, right? Can we get both scale up and scale down? Let's, let's do the million channel program and put it on like the crappiest hardware we can find, um, because 
if we can, you know, if your cell phone can handle a million channels on the Lightning Network, then I think we've really, you know, we've certainly buried a lot of FUD about uh, scalability of the Lightning Network, right? Um, and the answer is we made it work, uh, but we didn't make it fast. Uh, so yes, it works. We got it on there. It does not run out of memory anymore. Uh, it, it gives you answers slowly. It goes right. If you'll, you know, it, you can you can actually use it, um, which is amazing. But it is not a pleasant experience. Um, so there's like another level there, right? Uh, and the, the other level is like, do we do all this optimization? But then you know, Joe comes along and goes, oh, cool. Here's the 10 million channel project, or like the million nodes project, or something, and pushes the envelope again. And so we do all this optimization. We end up still as slow as we are, just doing 10 times as much work. Um, or do we kind of go, no, a million channels project is where it's at, and we'll keep working on that, and we optimize it to the point where your cell phone will handle it comfortably. Um, I don't know. There's, there's like, you know, optimization is kind of this thing. You can kind of keep refining and speeding up, and you can keep doing that pretty much forever. So at some point, you've got to actually shift. Uh, so we got to work. Uh, we got it, you know, reasonably happy, um, uh, and we went, right, we're, we're done. Here, here are the numbers, right? They're not pretty. It does work. It's not fast. Um, but it was important to us that, that we made some inroads on there uh, because I think that's, you know, uh, we, are, we are headed into a totally mobile world and we're going to need to do that. Now, this is, of course, a full Lightning node, right? It's not clear that you're Lightning, you know, as you kind of uh, mentioned, maybe you're connecting back to a, to a full node somewhere. You're not doing all the work on your, your cell phone. And I think that is uh, probably more realistic. But, you know, it's certainly, hey, it's, we're geeks, right? It's kind of fun to go, can we do this? And the answer was, yes, we can. There are also some of these other ideas being thrown around on the, you know, on the Lightning Dev mailing list and other potential routing schemes. Did you want to touch on some of those? What are they? And, you know, what are your thoughts on those? So I've seen here Ant routing um, and some of the others. Did you want to touch on those? Yeah, this is still very experimental. Uh, but basically, uh, the idea is like, for example, these beacons, for example, what if, what if we could make a routing scheme where instead of needing the entire network graph, because that's you know that could be a lot of data. We saw that with with a million channels, that could be like seven hundred megabytes of data. Instead of doing that, um, what if you just have a uh, the part of the network that allows you to reach these beacons, and then if the person that you're trying to send money to can also reach a beacon, then you could pretty much like basically a, a node that you can both reach then you can kind of do this routing between them. Then that's that's a possibility. Um, and there's other possibilities too, like, and then there's also like BGP, which is like the internet protocol. I don't think that would ever work because, but there's approaches like with BGP, maybe that are ideas of how routing could work, but I don't think they could work with Lightning Network because it just changes too fast. You know, you can't store a routing table of all these routes if the network is changing so fast that all these update messages would have to be passed around the network. It just wouldn't make any sense. Um, and there's privacy concerns with BGP. And that kind of leads to like ant routing. What if you just kind of um, send these encrypted blobs and kind of, and that's kind of confusing. It's very experimental, but it's basically like adding these extra data bits that kind of allows you to find a route in real time by these kind of encrypted blobs being traversed around the network. It's kind of cool, but I, it's very, again, experimental. Yeah, I think Joe covered that pretty well. There's, there's yeah, there's a, um, there, there, there are a subset of schemes where you're like, well, what if we don't have to hook the whole thing? What if we can, what if we can have some subset of knowledge or you can find out? Now, you, the problem is with subsets, you're going to be less efficient, but maybe that's okay. Who's in the subset? Who's in the magic group of beacons? Who becomes a beacon? Who, who are these landmarks that everyone uses? Because they're going to get like more payments than people who are not landmarks. So you end up with this fairness issue as well. Um, you know, how do you select them? Stuff like that. Uh, and there are, some, there are potentially some ways around that. But um, you know, other, other schemes where you kind of ask for directions um, and then you immediately hit privacy problems, right? You kind of go, oh, how do I get, it? How do I get a payment to Joe of, of like, you know, a 0.013 Bitcoin? Like, what's the cheapest way? Oh, no reason. I'm just, you know, just, just asking for a friend, you know, it, it's, it, you know, you're obviously leaking some data there. Um, so, you know, uh, there, there's some things where you can combine these approaches and stuff, but you know, um, the, what we were doing is like the naivest, you know, everything on the network, you've got the entire map, go find a route. Right. Uh, but these schemes are much more like, okay. So, so if, if we fall off the edge of the cliff there, we go, no, no, 10 million channels, way too many. You can't do that on your cell phone. 
what's our fallback? And, and so there's a whole lot of research on, on what cool things we can do uh, with that, which I think is interesting. Um, you know, and you also, you look at it, you know, cool, even, even if you could handle it all, uh, you know, the one gig download to, to get the map on your phone is, is pretty significant, right? That's, that's a big ask. Now we can squeeze that data down somewhat. Um, Taproot and Schnorr actually help us a little bit. We can, we can do some pretty cool stuff. Um, but you know, it'll still be that order of magnitude, right? So it'll be more than a hundred meg, uh, of data to pull down to know the entire thing. So then you're like, well, okay, maybe that's the issue. Maybe it's not that you can't compute it on your cell phone. Maybe you just don't want to, you know, swallow that fire hose when you start up. So, so yeah, there, there are definitely alternate approaches to how you can do things uh, with routing. And yeah, it's, it's an area of action. It's, it's, it is a fun area. And to add real quick, like you could even have approaches where there's a lightning app and instead of finding the route yourself, you, you kind of query some centralized server that, that has the whole map and then they, and they find it and tell you what route to take. But then there's, there's privacy concerns with that. And you don't know if they're, you don't really know if they're including their own nodes in your route to make more money and stuff like that. So they could opportunistically try and r route it through their own, right. their mates channels kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Wow. You go, wow, that's expensive. What a surprise yeah. <laughs> again. So Joe, I think you were also interested to talk about this idea of um, will lightning routing inevitably become hub and spoke? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it might already be slowly becoming hub and spoke. Um, but I think that really depends on on what we choose the kind of the routing protocol to be in the future, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's really dependent on on where we move forward. So, um, but I mean, we can see it already a little bit with you know where's the money at? Well, it's kind of this this hockey stick, and 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 also like how many channels do. Um, like here's an example. This is another property of 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 the of that I found in the snapshot of the network. Um, if you look at how do I explain this? Okay, so if you rank nodes, if if you rank channels of a node from greatest capacity to least, you see a uh, pretty much a positive relationship between the capacity of that channel. And the capacity and the total capacity of all the channels of the node that that that's connected to. So essentially, that means is that when people uh, when people are and, and this is this is minus that channel's capacity. So, so basically, but then what this, what this means is that when people are people are connecting two nodes with a lot of capacity. That's all it means. Uh, they put more money into nodes that have more capacity. And they put and and that kind of shows that people are kind of doing this hub thing already. Um, so I, I don't know. It, it, there's a there's a lot of question marks, but yeah. Yeah. So interestingly, like if you try to connect to BitRefill, which is one of the big, I mean, they're a vendor. They're in, in like network early. As a result, naturally, they've become this kind of hub, right? Um, but uh, they on on mainnet, they're they they won't even talk to you unless you've got like point. Um, 0.16 Bitcoin, I think it is. Like you need to actually open a big channel with them, otherwise they won't even let you open one. Um, so they've actually explicitly said, we only want big channels, right? So that's definitely uh, accelerating that trend. But just as a user, you're like, I'm gonna open a couple of channels. Well, look, I'll open one to Joe, but my main one is gonna be like a big one to a lot of the LN big nodes, right? Because they're really well connected. They're up all the time. You know, Joe's kind of flaky. He, he likes to sleep uh, and stuff like that. You know, uh, he turns his phone off sometimes. Yes, I love you to know. sleep. So, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so that this happens, right? So so people will naturally kind of bias towards that. Now there are a couple of things that are fighting against that. Um, we're, we're we're pushing back with, um, uh, with particularly with AMP, interestingly. So this idea that at the moment to to send a big payment, you need to send it down a single channel, right? You, you see payments are like you know these monolithic blobs, and this idea that we can split them into multiple parts and still have the properties that we want from payments. Um, is really cool. It's it's you know uh, there, there's a couple of spec proposals that are like right in the pipeline now. Um, um, I am really hoping to get it into the 073 release at least as an experimental feature um, that you can break up payments into little parts. Now at that point, big channels are nowhere near as useful as they are today. Today you need a big channel because you want to make bigger payments. You want you want to make a hundred dollar payment. 
you, you're going to need a hundred dollar channel, two fifty dollar channels are not going to cut it for you. With AMP, not a problem. You can split it, right? So it, it reduces some of that pressure to make really big channels with big players, um, and that allows the network to, to diversify a bit more. So that's that's kind of useful as well, I think. Um, and there's also things like we're seeing, um, oh, just just naturally, we are seeing growth of the network. So Ellen Beg jumped on. So this this was a, a uh, somebody who altruistically decided they basically wanted to support infrastructure for the network. So they created this network of like, I don't know, 60 nodes or something, each of which massive capacity that were basically all connected to each other. Um, and you could connect into that and you could kind of route anywhere. Um, and they've been stable, they've been useful and everything else. But even so, the growth of the network has kind of dwarfed them. Um, and while they're still there and they're still important, um, we're not at the stage where like, you take those nodes away, we're still good, right? So um, they haven't become... Uh, they, they've, been, they've been important in the growth of the network, absolutely. Uh, and they've pushed things up a notch. Um, but they are being kind of, you know, grown around, uh, which is great to see. So uh, so these two factors mean that I think, you know, I'm reasonably confident that we're not going to end up um, hub, and, hub and spoky more than the power law naturally would suggest, right? So, you know, uh, definitely that property is going to be there. There's going to be some big ones, going to be some small ones. Um, but I think we're going to see the needle swing back a bit uh, just because of the technical nature of stuff, uh, things coming down the pipe. Fantastic. Let's talk now about the results of the Million Channel Project. So maybe, Joe, you can tell us a little bit about the final, what was the simulated size in terms of nodes and channels and so on? So first off, uh, one of the big results is that we optimized uh, Sea Lightning. Like, I mean, Rusty did. You know, if we're optimized for Sea Lightning like crazy. Like, um, if you look at the blog post, there's a there's a nice graph that shows a nice you know, the before and after of you know some uh, some some uh, calls API calls and then you know shortest path and we just opt, rusty optimize it crazy um, and then also I'm trying to pull up here the uh, okay yep simulated size so we got a we got close to a million channels uh, it's like 998,000 channels, um, 94,000 nodes, um, and the gossip was 731 megabytes, uh, and then the, the total Bitcoin, except this is scaled down, this is actually scaled down in reg test, but the, the total Bitcoin is 17,300, uh, fake Bitcoin, of course, I wish I had that much, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's basically the end result of that. Yeah, it's interesting. Like less than a hundred thousand nodes. Yeah, uh, making those million channels of, of which you know twenty thousand uh, were were nodes with just one channel, right? Um, so that that parallel again, you know, right. a fifth of the nodes only had like one channel, uh, but then there are the whales who kind of made up for it. Yeah, and that and that matches kind of what we see right now. So that's why it's like that. Yeah. So uh, in terms of making it work on the Rust Pi three, what was uh, required there? <laughs> Other than going to, 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 to you know, uh, buying myself a Raspberry Pi and hooking it up, which is always kind of fun. Um, so, uh, you know, the first, the main thing is that it's memory constrained, right? So it has like uh, two gigabytes and you could give it some swap, but even so, right? Uh, just, just keeping the whole million channels in memory um, was originally, uh, you know, space wasn't something that we'd really optimize for. Uh, and <clears throat> like originally we would basically pull that 731 megabytes that, that, that whole store of all the gossip we've ever received, we would just like pull that all into memory uh, and leave it there um, rather than leaving it on disk. And so immediately what happened is my Raspberry Pi ran out of memory um, and it crashed badly, right? And so uh, there were a couple of things here. One is like, okay, well, it should give some meaningful message when it goes, runs out of memory, it should do something sane rather than just kind of dying randomly. So there were some fix ups in that. Um, but the other thing is like, even if you asked it to list all the channels, it would, you know, we have a little tool that you can use to talk to see lightning and you go, okay, cool. Give me the channel list, right? And it'll just spit you back like these million channels, um, except it's 2 billion because it prints out each direction as like a separate half. So it's this massive fire hose. Um, and then that tool would crash, right? Because it, it would try to load up, it would basically take the response, try to format it all for you, but it couldn't even fit in memory, right? So all these things are kind of making it more graceful with, with handling these kind of things that, that we'd never hit in real life yet. Uh, but inevitably we will. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was just shrinking things down to fit inside the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we've done a lot of optimization already, but, you know, my laptop has like 8 gig of RAM. Um, 
it had no problems. Uh, you, so you shrink down to these little machines and you go, okay, well, we're going to have to actually squeeze things here as well. So there's like another, so another round of optimization just to get it to run at all uh, in that environment. So yeah, um, a lot of cool stuff came out of that. Um, we, we now keep the gossip on disk and we just basically hand around, here's, here's where it is, you can go get it yourself. Um, we used to have this gossip demon that, that took care of all the gossip. Um, and so when someone connected in and they wanted to know something, the, the little demon that was talking to them would talk to the gossip demon and go, cool, here's what they want to know. And it would shuffle this data back and forth. Um, and we went, well, actually, now we're putting it all on disk. Let's have the demon just look at the disk itself, grab out the file, and just start spreading it out. Um, and that's actually a huge win itself, both because now we don't have all these memory, you know, no one's loading up and keeping it in memory, but also just, just the speed, the scalability that we can do with that is actually pretty nice. So, so that work went in. Um, and while it makes it you know, work on the Raspberry Pi, it, it lifted everything across the board, right? Um, it, it makes it faster on, on my example nodes and stuff like that. So um, and the other thing that Sea Lightning does really badly um, is that it's really chatty. Um, it used to be up until the latest release, every time we connected to someone, they said, cool, give us all the gossip. Tell us everything. You know, it works. Uh, you, you never miss anything, everybody. You know, but basically, you ask for this fire hose every time. And so, when your node restarts and you've got like a hundred channels, you connect to all of them and you go, "Tell me everything you know." And it would, you know, uh, there would be a lot of stress at that point on this, this, you know, this central demon to just kind of like to digest all this stuff. Uh, and God forbid you were talking to another sea lightning node because it would also ask you, "Hey, you can you tell me everything you know?" And we would then just like feed it everything, right? Um, so in the last release, we got a little bit smarter with that. Um, you know, obviously, if, if if we're up to date within the last 24 hours, we go, cool, just give us the last 24 hours. Um, and we ask that for only a handful of nodes, like we'll ask for eight. And beyond that, we just go, look, don't don't worry at all. Um, uh, so we have kind of this this high, medium, low. Actually, sorry, it's it's three three nodes. We ask for it, cool. You you give me everything in the last 24 hours, and then we go, cool. You just give me everything from now. And if we've got more than eight, we, with the rest of them, we just don't tell any gossip, right? I've got enough gossip. And if we detect something weird, we go, hold on, we didn't know about that channel when we should have. Then we go back and we pick someone at random. We go, cool, can you tell me everything? Um, and we go back and grab the log. But that's that's just way friendlier on the network as a whole. Um, but I didn't want to do that before I did the million channels optimization because the fact that we were so dumb about it stressed this stuff really nicely, right? Um, I wanted to make it fast, make it work. Uh, we actually uncovered a bug in LND's implementation because um, my node was so slow because uh, I run it with a whole group of extra debugging checks, that um, <clears throat> when we asked them to connect a channel, but we were also asking for all the gossip, we didn't get their message, their reply, through all the gossip that they were sending us until it was too late. It would time out on us. So we uncovered a number of bugs uh, with the way we handled gossip. So um, so yeah, there's, there's been a whole heap of work on this. And this this is, you know again, this is an ongoing thing. Um, there'll be more gossip optimizations coming in in 073. Uh, so, you know, it, it does it does keep us ahead. You know, every so often you go back to the million channels project and go, okay, so so how are we performing today? Uh, because if you don't keep measuring this stuff, you inevitably, you know, you put some things in, you didn't realize how badly it's going to affect the million channels case. So we tighten the screws once, you do have to go back and check uh, every so often that you're still, uh, that you keep yourself honest. Excellent. Uh, let's talk a bit about ideas for future work. Maybe, Joe, did you want to touch on if there's any ideas on what could be a good project or good ideas to look at for next time? Yeah. So the, the Million Channels project should always, can always be expanded. Like, for example, um, yeah, the properties of the LED network, like the power law distribution, stuff like that, um, they weren't really that important in optimizing C-Lightning. They weren't really that used that much, but they would be important if we were testing different routing protocols. So there could be a, a way to use a million channels project to see if, you know, compare different routing protocols and, and see what, which one fares better. And then it's really important if we have a uh, kind of an accurate topology and an accurate uh, channel capacities. So that's interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I'm interested to see how, how well it tracks, like, you know, as we do get to a million channels, right. How accurate was this simulation? I mean, we obviously took, we extrapolated, right? Right, exactly. Um, yeah. There'll probably be changes. It'll be really interesting to see the real million channels project. Like, when, when the Lightning Network really is a million channels, like, how close did we get, right? Yeah, that'd be really cool, too. Yeah. And the thing, this is cool, too. I didn't mention this, but I compared um, the, the actual 
Lightning Network in January to the actual Lightning Network in May. And it does the properties that I, that I kind of grabbed out of it still hold. They, they held in, in, the, in the data in January and the data in May. That's pretty cool. And so maybe they'll keep holding. I don't, I don't know. Also, Joe, I think you um, were chatting before. You had a few thoughts around the micro and macro purposes of Bitcoin and economics. What were your thoughts there? Yeah, I kind of have a, a side hobby or passion with economics, which you can kind of see in the Million Channels Project. But um, I I know that a lot of your listeners are kind of Austrian-based, and so that's kind of why I want to talk about economics a little bit. Um so I, I kind of split economics into uh, macro and micro like most economists do, but I define it a little bit differently and I view micro, the purpose of micro, as uh, guiding rational action towards some goal for individuals and for companies. And so it's for example, that's uh, game theory, um, like utility functions, stuff like that. Uh, and then I view macro as predicting or forecasting the future changes in economic outcomes based on changes in policy and changes in technology, etc. cetera. Um, and so that includes econometrics that includes um i would even say a little bit of behavioral econ because you got to know how people are actually going to at, react to a certain policy in the real world of biases and stuff and so i kind of and this is kind of a recent uh, recent discovery like basically micro is for guiding guiding individual action macro is for forecasting and i think that's pretty cool Right. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it's, um, I th yeah, I, I think it's, I guess, comparing against like an Austrian framework, it's kind of like, we're thinking more about the decisions that are made by individuals. And then in a macro sense, it's like, what are the impacts that that has at this if you're considering what all these different individuals are doing, what's the impact that that does, you know, to the broader, uh, world and the broader economy. Exactly. Um, right. but, uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Rusty, I'd be also interested just to discuss if you've got anything you wanted to share around what's coming with C Lightning and the new version. Oh, yeah. So um, always, always heaps of stuff. So what, what's, um, and there's inevitable sort of bug fixes and, 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 and optimizations and stuff. We've had a lot of excitement around plugins. So the idea with, with C Lightning is basically uh, we wanted to build like this base. Uh, we wanted to build uh, a really solid implementation that, that that does all the things you expect from a node, uh, particularly aiming at the server side, right? So that's that's my background. It's kind of block streams interest. Um, you know, uh, you want to set up a, a a store that accepts Lightning. Okay, so let's let's that this is the kind of infrastructure you want. Um, but there's a whole lot of really cool stuff we want to build on top, and we kind of went, well, the, these ideas started coming out that people want to do, and we're like, oh, we really don't want that in our code base because it's kind of boutique to these people. It's really cool. We're not sure how many people use it. We have to support it and everything else. So we ended up coming into this plugin idea where basically people write plugins the same way they write plugins for like web browsers and stuff to do ad blocking or, you know, turn the screen upside down and stuff. So um, C Lightning has been really aggressive, kind of doing a lot of infrastructure work to grow that plugin infrastructure um, so that plugins can do more and more invasive and, 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 and interesting stuff. Um, so with each release, we see, we see, uh, more capability built for plugins, and the plugins themselves lag a bit because someone actually has to then have to go and use them. So we've got a database hook that went in the last release, uh, which means that you can do like live backups. So if you want to do multi-site backups for your C Lightning node, which is you know uh, which is important because um, obviously there's real money involved, and you want to kind of you know backups are important. Um, don't be like me, uh, back up your stuff. Uh, I have a test node that's completely not backed up um, that I use for test payments, but. Um, but you know, in sort of this this robust scenario, you're going to be doing backups. You want backups across multiple sites in real time and stuff like that. So you know, there's that infrastructure that goes in. But there's also some really cool uh, infrastructure for expanding things and doing experimental things. Um, the other thing that we're seeing come through is um, we had this big spec meeting uh, in Adelaide uh, in November of last year, uh, and we kind of drew a roadmap of what's going to be in the one, like the 1.1, or might, be, might even call it 2.0 uh, Lightning spec. Um, 
and everyone came in with all these ideas and we kind of threshed out this this kind of rough map of stuff that definitely should be in 1.1 um, and now we're going through the phase of actually doing the the right you know the, the, the hard work of like writing it all down specking it all out writing test vectors making sure everyone's on the same page and all the details a lot of bike shedding a lot of you know uh, finagling the details uh, but that's really started to come to a head now we've gotten you know a, a lot of this stuff's getting agreed um, People got distracted because there was so much stuff to work on outside this, even just in the 1.0 spec. Um, so uh, just recently in the last few meetings, we have a meeting every couple of weeks. Um, we've had sort of the floodgates open, a whole heap of stuff go in. And so the, you'll see the excitement ramp up in the implementations as well as they start to implement these features. So I talked about uh, AMP, for example, this, this um, a multi-part payment uh, idea. Um, that is definitely something that I want to get back to. Uh, we've got a spec proposal out. We want to implement it. The rule is that you've got to have two implementations that can interoperate before it can go into the spec finally, right? So we kind of approve it like that's a good idea, but it's pending testing and it takes two people, separate people have to implement it, make sure they work together, and then we can like go from full. Uh, and that's saved us a number of times just because, you know, you, you've got to implement it, you know, wow, if we don't, if we chose this way instead of that way, this would be so much easier. So, you know, uh, so that's the way things go forward. And we're going to see that uh, in, in the implementations in the next few months uh, as we ramp up. Uh, we also have the Lightning Conference. So there's um, this this conference. It's really a, a Lightning developer conference. So previously, we've had these summits, which are about developing the Lightning spec, right? The protocol. And, you know, we get into like deep in the weeds of kind of, you know, actually how Lightning implementations work. So people who write Lightning implementations are there. The Lightning Conference is more like people using Lightning, like developers one layer up who are using Lightning to build their stuff and, and do cool things on top of it. And there's a great community uh, of Lightning makers out there. Um, and there have been some like meetups and everything, and we thought it's time to take it to the next level. So uh, all the teams are basically going to be in Berlin uh, at the Lightning Conference, thelightningconference.com. Um, and you know uh, that, that's, I'm really excited about that because that's always fun, right? You meet a lot of people doing really interesting things with, with Lightning. Um, but also all the devs are going to be there. It's going to be like an ad hoc spec meeting. We're going to like thrash out all of this stuff. So, um, so yeah, and, and Berlin's always, always a fun city. So, um, so that's coming up as well. Um, and inevitably that will change. Like it'll be before and after that meeting. Um, there'll probably be some stuff come out of that that will completely change our priorities, right? People might say, well, this is really important. And we're like, we didn't even think of that. Um, that happens always when we talk to users about their pain points and things. So I'm really looking forward to that experience. Um, and that's definitely going to accelerate things. Just generally, this whole ecosystem is kind of snowballing. Like it's so. On the one hand, it's frustratingly slow. On the other hand, it's it's day to day. It, it is really exciting because stuff happens all the time. Um, but when you think about it, we're we're basically trying to build a whole new industry here, right? There's there's no micropayment industry because there are no micropayments in the world. Um, we don't have the ability to send one cent around the world until Lightning. So we've kind of built this thing. And it takes time for people to kind of, you know, maybe there was someone out there who had this fantastic idea five years ago, but they couldn't do it because they couldn't send one cent. It just, you know, it, it didn't make sense. Like they discarded it, right? Um, it takes time for those ideas to kind of converge and to get those ideas to go, hey, cool, we can actually do this now. We've got the capability, but it's instantly, instantly settled uh, transfer of, of, of value of small amounts um, really cheaply. What can we do with that now? Um, and this industry will take, you know, I mean, this is a long process to build a whole new industry around this, um, but it's definitely happening. And, you know, that's, that's exciting to me. And that's, that is definitely going to continue. And I expect we'll see this kind of like, um, you know, this slow, steady technical growth, but then at some point it kind of kicks upwards as, as there's some ridiculous killer app. There's probably something that, you know, Stefan and I will sit here and go, that is the stupidest idea ever, right? But it'll be amazingly <laughs> successful and, you know, they'll be flying in corporate jets and stuff. And, Hashtag you know, crypto kitties. Like, yeah, that's right. You know, it will be something uh, something that kids are into these days. And we'll be sitting there going, well, that's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? So um, <laughs> there, there'll be something. There'll be some killer app at some point. Um, and, you know, in retrospect, it'll be obvious. But from this this point of view, it's totally not. Um and I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing that happening. But, you know, you can't control the timeline on these things. You've got to have the infrastructure ready. You've got to have all the capability. You've got to have the experience. People are kind of getting accustomed to how these things work and building all these, you know, examples and, and doing some real stuff on it. Um, and that infrastructure is basically uh, is required before you can have that amazing growth 
uh, on top of it. So we're still in that early infrastructure days. Um, and while it's exciting for those inside of it, it hasn't really got outside that bubble, um, even though the bubble's growing, right? At some point, I expect it will explode on the world stage and suddenly people will be like, wow. And I'll be like, I've been working on this stuff for years now. <laughs> and they're like, no, it was, it, it's only been invented like two weeks ago. And I'm like, no, actually it's, we, we were working on this for a while. So, so that's, that's definitely something to look forward to if you look further. Uh, but making solid predictions about it is impossible. Yeah, look, that's great. I think um, that's pretty much all I was keen to uh, going to touch on for this episode. So uh, thank you both for joining me. And uh, look, before we let you go, uh, let's uh, hear from both of you on where the listeners can find you and follow your work. So uh, Joe, let's start with you. Where can the listeners find you? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter with Joe Netty, uh, J-O-E-N-E-T-T-I. Also on GitHub, uh, Netty Joe 96 And that's, it. that's about it. Great. And uh, Rusty, is it for you? Yeah, so Rusty Russell on GitHub and um, Rusty underscore twit on Twitter. Um, uh, you know, but Google will find me as well. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, always like hearing from people too. So reach out. Fantastic. And I'll obviously put the link to the Million Channel blog post as well for the, in the show notes. So look, Rusty and Joe, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you for having me on. Thanks, Stefan. So if you guys found that interesting and you're interested in more detail, you can see the Million Channels Project blog post and GitHub links in the show notes. Check out the show notes on my website, stefanlevera.com. Any feedback for me, find me on Twitter, at stefanlevera, or email me, stefanlevera at pm.me. As usual, I appreciate any ratings and reviews for the podcast. That really helps new people find me. That's it from me. Thanks, guys, and I will see you in the Citadels.